Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, everybody, welcome to the virtual petal fall and thinning meeting. My name is Sarah Alane and I'm a technician with the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. And we thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to begin with an introduction from Dan Donahue, who's a tree fruit specialist with the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program based in the Hudson Valley. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. Welcome to the first of our series of spring extension webinars here in Eastern New York. As we begin, I want to make a shout out to our commercial sponsor for this series, Owesco in Conway, Massachusetts, with a big thank you for their financial support for our spring series. The people at Owesco would like to thank everyone for this opportunity and remind that they are here for you with parts, service, and sales support through these stressful times. Owesco staff may be it may be reached at 413-369-4335 or the 800 number you see on the screen Monday through Friday from 7 to 5. Thanks again to Owesco. So our focus today will be multidisciplinary and we're going to cover fruit set and early thinning strategies with Dr. Terrence Robinson of Cornell University Agritech, then insect pest management with Peter Jensch, disease management with Dr. Sergin Achemovich, uh, with uh, sunburn, a discussion of sunburn uh, control management with Donna Achemovich, all of the Cornell Hudson Valley Lab, and uh, also a few comments about weed management from our own Mike Baisdow of the Cornell Cooperative Extension Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. And of course, I'm Dan Donahue, and I'll make a few comments about bitter pit suppression and harvest prediction in Honeycrisp. Our MC today is Sarah Alani of the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. With that, I'll turn the meeting back to Sarah for a few tips on how to use Zoom. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna give an overview of the webinar controls um, that you as participants can use. We have um, a raise hand button. We're gonna have, uh, during the meeting, there's gonna be times that are dedicated to answering questions. And um, these speakers are gonna announce when these times are. And there are two ways to ask a question. You can either type your question into the Q&A window or you can raise your hand. And if your hand is raised, you'll be called on to ask your question. So this is what the raise hand button looks like. And when you press that um, and the speaker would like you to ask your question, you'll be allowed to unmute yourself. A little button will pop up for you to press. We also have the Q&A option. By clicking here, you'll open up the Q&A window, which will allow you to type a question to the speaker. They can answer with a typed answer in the window, which will look something like this, or there will be a notification that they will answer your question live. You can click on the audio settings um, if you need to change the speaker that your sound is coming out of. You can also test your speaker and microphone with this option. And there is a leave meeting button. Um, you can leave the webinar at any time. If you leave, you can rejoin if the webinar is still in progress. So those are the options. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Terrence Robinson. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real uh, pleasure to join you today to talk about chemical thinning. Um, it's a difficult topic this year because of the frost damage that has occurred in eastern New York, and I hope to address it um, in a way that will help guide you in what you should do this year. It's um, difficult for me because I haven't been there since March. I will plan a trip before our next meeting to physically look at orchards, but I'm relying heavily on the eyes of Dan Donahue and Donna Simovic, who have done some excellent uh, bud analysis for me. And I've also relied heavily on the weather stations that are connected to the NUA network for seeing what has happened and what's projected for the future. I'm gonna to try to share a few slides in this presentation. I expect to talk about 20 minutes, leaving 10 minutes for questions. Um, I hope that uh, you'll be willing to ask your questions so that everybody can benefit from what's going on in the valley because I haven't been there and I haven't seen what's going on. <clears throat> so 
So I start with this slide that um, shows sort of the typical um, precision crop load management model that we like to use. Um, it starts with blossom thinning using the pollen tube growth model. Now this year has been a very challenging year to do blossom thinning. And so mostly I have suggested not to use blossom thinning this year. Um, I'll go through a little bit of the specifics of that as we go forward in the presentation. <clears throat> but it then continues with um, a pedophile spray and that spray should be guided by results of the carbon balance model. And I'll talk a little bit of specifically about what I'm seeing with that model as we prepare in the next few days for a petal fall spray. After that spray, we really need in this year to measure some fruit diameters and see what kind of fruit growth we get and how many are falling off naturally or through the thinning spray before we make any decisions on that critical 10 to 13 millimeter spray, which is our main thinning spray. We hope that we have another webinar before that 10 millimeter spray with more data to try to guide our actions as we get to that point. If that spray works, that will be the end of it. If it doesn't work, we will then have one more opportunity when fruits are 16 to 20 millimeters to try to get crop load adjusted down to a target fruit number. Now, let me first address this bloom thinning idea in 2020. Repeated frosts have damaged king flowers, which made bloom thinning very risky in 2020. This is data that Donna uh, collected at the lab, and it has a number of very interesting things in it. First, I want to have you look at the percent king mortality. She has two dates after, in early May after that April frost, and then in, on 11th of May after the May 9th frost. But you can see that empires have at least at the lab, have almost all the kinks gone. Other varieties, a lesser amount with the least amount of king damage with Honeycrisp, but surprisingly, other varieties like the Ruby Frost are very high, and surprisingly, also Gala in the 65%. Now, if you look at the May 3rd line for Gala, you know, after that April frost, it was only about 15% of the kings were damaged, but that May 9th frost really hammered again. Now this data does not include the more recent frosts of uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, which uh, have damaged even more kings. Now when we lose kings, it really complicates chemical thinning. And because of that, uh, I told Donna earlier that we really shouldn't blossom thin in the Hudson Valley in 2020. Now, with Honeycrisp, where damage to kings was less, or 40%, really, you probably still could do it, but I didn't want to risk that um, possibly more frost would come and complicate blossom thinning, even on Honeycrisp. A second interesting point is the amount of lateral flower within the cluster damage. In Empire, even many of the laterals are damaged. So it's real iffy if we're going to have a decent or a reasonable empire crop. Other varieties have much lower levels of damage on lateral flowers. For example, Honeycrisp, we still have most of the laterals there. I think we can have an excellent crop, Fuji as well. But again, surprising to me is New York too looks like most of the laterals are damaged, which is really a worrisome trend. If you put that together in this total flower mortality, with Empire and uh, Ruby Frost up in the uh, 80 or above all the flowers damaged, those two varieties essentially need no thinning. Typically, if we precision prune, and we prune pretty well to have you know, a certain number of buds, when we thin, we wanna reduce it down to about 10% or say kill 90, knock off 90%. But through the frost, we've already knocked off 80 to 85. And this doesn't take into account the frost that happened Tuesday night and Wednesday night, which means with those varieties, they shouldn't get a drop of thinner. However, other varieties, um, you know, where you have Gala at 66% total damage and uh, Snapdragon at 67, they're still gonna have more fruit than what their optimum target should be. 
we really need to knock off 90% of all the flowers through thinning. So there's still a number of flowers we need to get rid of, and there is where we're gonna need to do some very judicious thinning. And I'll give some suggestions as we go forward. On the other hand, you have uh, both Honeycrisp and Fuji that still have 70% uh, or around 60 to 70% of all the flowers still out there, and you have to get rid of a lot more flowers to get down to a reasonable crop load. So those two varieties will probably need significant thinning. These data illustrate how critical it is to make an assessment of your block. Your location may be different than the Hudson Valley Lab. Dan was just telling me that he made an assessment of a block in Valacia, and uh, there was you know, substantial damage. But if you can come up with some sort of a precise or a, a, a numeric value of damage like Donna has done, it's really helpful to decide what to do. We suggest that you just go out and cut flowers, but do it in a systematic way. Cut 50 kings and then 50 laterals and see how many are damaged in that cutting of 50 and come up with some percentages. If the percent damage of kings is above 50%, then you really have to be cautious on thinning. But also if the lateral damage is really high, that would suggest probably no thinning. When you combine the two together and you have only 10 or 15% of all the flowers on that acre still alive, that requires absolutely no thinning. So this is really a challenging year. And every orchard's different. And I just really encourage you to look at your particular variety in your particular orchard, top of the hill versus bottom of the hill as you try to make these decisions. Now let me go on just to comment on a couple of other things. Unfortunately, blossom thinning is essential for return bloom of Honeycrisp and Fuji. Those two varieties uh, didn't have as much damage as others. And I wish that we had figured out a way to do blossom thinning of those two varieties, but probably the frost has reduced the number of flowers enough that we won't go biennial. Because to control biennial bearing on those two varieties, you have to get rid of flowers at bloom. In this particular year, the frost has done it for us. So if we can follow it up with some post-bloom thinning, we'll probably be okay for return bloom next year. But for future reference, I just show this slide showing a trial we did a few years back showing that the best return bloom, the longest yellow bar, came from ATS at bloom and then some XL7 later on at 10 millimeters. But that ATS at bloom, whether by itself or with a post bloom thinner, is where we got the best repeat bloom. Uh, just for future reference, if that's where we go next year, and I'll be here again next year to try to make the same point. We're spraying ATS, but spraying it a little bit earlier when, when we use a pollen tube growth model, about the 60% level rather than waiting to 100. If we wait to 100, we're not getting very good thinning. I'm going to leave that blossom thinning topic for now, and I'd like to go on just to talk about the options that we have with post-bloom thinning, starting at petal fall when fruits are five to six millimeters. Now, I wish I had been there to measure fruits, but based upon the degree day accumulations that I'll talk about in a minute, I don't think you're at the five to six millimeter stage yet. It's still a few days away. So that gives us time to prepare for a petal fall spray. Now, there are a number of chemical options that you can use at petal fall, including seven alone or amethyst or Maxellan 7, or NAA and 7, or Maxellan NAA. For those people who don't want to use carbaryl in their program, the um, Maxellan NAA has worked very well for us. My favorite at petal fall is highlighted in blue, is the NAA and 7. In most cases, the NAA is a mile thinner at petal fall, and 7 is also a mile thinner. The combination of the two just helps knock off some of the laterals that are weak and helps get the number of fruit per cluster down from four to either one or two. Now this year with the frost having damaged a number of laterals and a number of kings, 
I think it will still be an excellent way to try to get the number of fruits down to one in the cluster. Now let me comment briefly about the loss of kings. Some varieties, when you lose the king due to frost, you can still have an excellent crop with one lateral. Empire is one of those. The damage level on empire is relatively high, but if there's one lateral, we can still have a very nice sized apple and an excellent crop. But the damage level on empire leads me to say we probably shouldn't put any thinner on it. But other varieties where the king is damaged and the lateral is your basic crop, fruit size is smaller. And that's particularly with Fuji and Red Delicious. So it's unfortunate if we have to depend on lateral flowers for our crop with those two varieties, but sometimes there's nothing you can do. In that case, the NAN7 will help reduce the number of other laterals to give the, the one lateral that's the most competitive, the biggest, um, a fighting chance to get a decent sized fruit by eliminating this competition very early on. Now, we don't know what will happen as we move forward to get to the 10, 11, 12, 13 millimeter fruit stage when we normally put on our most important thinning spray. That's the point in time when we'll have another meeting and we'll talk about what our best options are. But just for the moment, I've highlighted in blue my favorite combination at the 10 millimeter, 11 millimeter, 12 millimeter stage. If by chance, there are some blocks that don't thin and we get all the way out to 15, 16, 17 millimeters and there's just too many apples. There are three combinations that we've tried over the years. The one that has worked the best is just Max Helen 7 with a pint of oil added as a surfactant. That has consistently given us the best thinning at this very large fruit size. Now a couple of uh, <clears throat> thoughts on post-bloom thinning for 2020. I think it's critical to use a carbohydrate model this year to avoid overthinning. Our big risk this year is overthinning, where we've had damage and then we go thin as normal and we knock most of the fruit off. There exists both a normal web-based NUA web version of the carbohydrate model and also the mobile phone app called Malusim is available for free. You can download it from either the app store for an iPhone or the Android store for an Android phone for free. And on your phone with just a couple of clicks, you can immediately run the model and see where you are in terms of carbohydrate deficit. And in just a few minutes, I'll show you what it looks like today for Milton. The one caution I want you to be aware of is if you see carbohydrate deficits of minus 50 or less, don't spray this year. Now in other years, that level of carbohydrate between minus 50 and minus 60 sometimes is really helpful to get the fruit off. But this year I fear that that level of carbohydrate deficit will essentially drop all the fruit. It probably will cause some natural drop. So whenever, if we get in a situation and we're about to put a thinner on and you run this model as you're loading your tank and you see minus 50, just don't spray that day. A second very useful feature of the carbohydrate model, which we introduced last year, is that we've added a column for degree days, base four degrees C or 38. And we found that when we get around 200 degree days since bloom, up to 250 degree days since bloom, is when we get the best response from thinners. Now that's generally when fruits are about 12 to 13 millimeters. So we like to use that uh, column in the carbohydrate model because it will predict several days forward the degree day accumulation. And you can kind of plan ahead several days when you're going to be in that sweet spot window between 200 and 250 degree days to try to plan your thinning a few days in advance. And hopefully one of the days when you're in that window will be a decent spray day. Just for your reference, I've listed that uh, petal fall generally falls around 100 to 125 degree days. 
And you'll see in the next slide that we're not close to, we're still a ways away from that in the Milton data that I ran just a couple of hours ago. So the petal fall thinning spray should wait a couple of days. You'll also notice that if we get in a position where we have to spray very late at the 16 and 17 millimeters, that's generally in the 300 to 350 degree day range on the carbohydrate model. I'd like to now present the data that I got off of NUA and the carbohydrate model for Milton for today. Now the first on uh, the top chart shows you the carbohydrate balance since this very, very early green tip. March, Dan and I were coming back from a meeting in Pennsylvania and it was already green tip. But it's just taken forever to progress to bloom. And so you see in the early part of this chart, a continued deficit just because there's not enough leaf area, but we got up there about April 17th where we had a slight positive carbohydrate balance. There was enough leaf area and it was cool to produce a carbohydrate balance, but then it went negative as we had several days with not enough sunshine and deficits through that pink stage and early bloom. Now, if bloom happened somewhere May 4th, May 5th, we've had in the last few days a positive carbohydrate balance, not a huge positive, but a slight positive, you know, of about 10 grams. But in the last four days, we've entered into a deficit. Now, I put down here the actual numbers. Ah, sorry. You see the green shows today, May 14th, and the maximums predicted 67, the minimum 31, 20 megajoules of light, and that gives a carbohydrate deficit of, or balance of about zero. Oh, that, no, that's the, yeah, the daily deficit of about zero. The average is a minus 26 because it's predicted that tomorrow we're coming up on a big deficit day. It's predicted to go to 78, now, whether that happens or not, I don't know. But if it happens with only moderate sunshine, we're gonna have a huge deficit day. And that's what drives this negative number on the average. But if you look at the last column, there's only 63 degree days since bloom. So that we're still a ways away from this 100 to 125 when we should be spraying petal fall. And if you look forward at predicted days on the 16, 17, we're gonna get somewhere in that 100 range on the 19th. So that would lead us to think that maybe early next week is the time for the petal fall spray, according to this degree day model. I wish I was there with boots on the ground to see what's actually happening. But I like to wait until fruits are five to six millimeters, and that's gonna be somewhere around this 100 degree day before I put on a petal fall thinning spray. By that time, you know, I don't know exactly if these forecasted temperatures will play out, but it's a 78 tomorrow, then in the low 70s, then in the 60s. Uh, nights not so cold, but no nights up in the 60s. So we'll have kind of mild uh, daily deficits. Uh, and so I think we'll have a de reasonable deficit, but not an excessive deficit when we get to the petal fall spray for the petal fall thinning spray, which will be good. But you will see as we go forward, there will this be recommend, recommendation in words. When it's green, it says you can spray and there's no real risk of over thinning. If we get down in here in these days early next week and that changes color to red, that is a very dangerous day to thin. And so just pay attention to the colors and what these words say as you move forward into early next week in a petal fall thinning spray. I hope this is gonna be helpful to you. I, I really recommend that this year you try to use the carbohydrate model. Dan will probably put out in his daily faxes or emails, whatever, uh, this sort of what the results are for both lower Hudson Valley, mid Valley, uh, and hopefully guide people on how they should start thinking about it early next week. Now, let's assume that you do put on a petal fall spray. To me, this year it's essential to measure some fruit diameters and run the fruit growth rate model to see where you're at. If we can have, if we can define a target and then we measure fruits, we can very quickly within about seven days tell you exactly how many fruits are still on that tree. 
That to me is so valuable information in this year. That will define whether you put on a normal thinning spray at 10 millimeters or you just completely skip it. But without that information, we're really flying blind. I know it's a pain in the neck to go out and tag spurs and measure fruits. Now I know that Donna is gonna do at least one block for us at the Hudson Valley, probably Gala, and that information we will generally publicize all over the valley, but it would be very helpful for your individual farm if you had that data. I will again offer that if you take the data and send it to me by email, I will review it and give you my opinion, personal opinion on that data within 24 hours of you having sent it to me. So there's no reason to measure fruits until after the petal fall spray, but about three or four days after the petal fall spray, you measure your first measurement, and then four days later, you measure your second measurement, and then send me the data, or run it yourself using the, the, either the online model or the phone app model, which is very easy to use. So I wanna to try to summarize my thoughts at this point. I might change my mind next week when I'm down there in person. I told Dan, I'm just gonna go down there incognito. I'm not gonna to talk to anybody. I'm not gonna get sick. I'm just gonna be in your orchard secretly to see what's going on. But my first suggestion is you have to assess each block and each variety separately. A couple of thoughts. If kingflower damage is greater than 40%, but you still have a lot of lateral, damage, lateral flowers that are undamaged, then I think we got to thin, but with relatively low rates. How low of rate? I would say about two thirds of your normal rate. When you have high king damage, but you still have a lot of laterals. But if you have a lot of king and a lot of lateral damage where the total damage is greater than 75%, I don't think you thin at all. You just try to adjust with some hand thinning later. Now, if the block requires chemical thinning, I think you've got to use this precision thinning program. Now we're past bloom, but that would only be done where you have less than 40% damage on the kings. But we're coming up on a petal fall spray and time it based upon this degree day calculator in the carbohydrate model. Try to shoot between 100 and 125 degree days. But it's critical that after that spray, three days later and then four days after that, you measure fruitlets and assess the response so we can know how many fruits are still there. Then if necessary, you apply a 12 millimeter spray, which is about 200 to 250 degree days from bloom. And then again, reassess the response using the fruit growth, measuring fruit diameters using the fruit growth rate model. And then there will be possibly a few people this year that will need a rescue spray at 18 millimeters, 300 to 350 degree days. I doubt we're gonna need much of that this year, but we do have that option if needed. Point number three, if there has been frost damage, generally it's worse in the bottom of the tree than the upper part of the tree. This is a year to turn off the nozzles for every thinning spray on the bottom of the tree. Don't apply any thinner to the bottom of the tree. There will be enough drift down that you'll still get some thinning. We've done a number of trials over the years where we looked at the distribution pattern within the tree and often we get the most uniform pattern where we apply nothing to the bottom of the tree, even on a normal year. But especially on a frost damage year, apply nothing to the bottom of the tree. My last point is, this is a year when surfactants like regulator oil could be dramatically problematic. Because of damage to leaf surface, there could, those particular regulated oil can cause much more uptake of these hormones and cause much more thinning. So some people have gotten in the habit of putting some regulate with thinners. That's dangerous this year. So don't put any of those surfactants in with your thinning sprays. Those are my thoughts uh, at this point in time. I'd like, uh, I think we've gone on quite a while, but I'd hope there's some few minutes for questions. I open it up now for anybody to ask me a question or pose a question on the chat box. Currently, we have, we have one question in the question and answer session and it says, will NAA use in bloom be less likely to over thin if there is some damage to kings, but still reduce the tendency of biannual bearing in Honeycrisp? Yes, it will reduce the tendency for biennial bearing. I would say on Honeycrisp, where the damage to kings is less than 40%, we should go ahead with an NAA spray. 
the NA spray is not so timing critical as an ATS spray. You're probably past the point of an ATS spray, but an NA spray during bloom will be very helpful if the damage to kings is less than 40%, meaning you still have 60% of the kings alive. And it will help reduce biennial bearing. Karen, so I'd like to ask for a clarification of when you turn the lower nozzles off to not spray the lower half of the tree, uh, should you maintain the rate per acre? So that is, in that case, slow the rig down to make sure you're keeping the rate constant, or are you simply turning the nozzles off? It's an excellent question, Dan, and I should have clarified that. I would like to keep the rate per acre the same as normal, but put it all through the upper nozzles. Now, I would suggest you turn off a third of the nozzle, the lower third, leaving two thirds open. This either requires you to slow down the rig or re-nozzle so you can still put out your normal total water volume and your normal concentration. But it all goes in the upper part of the tree. Now, I say that also remembering to remind you and everybody that I think this year, where we've had damage, we want lower rates to start with two-thirds of a normal rate. But if I put on two-thirds of a normal rate and then I shut off nozzles, now I'm only getting like half of the total rate per acre. So I don't want to just shut off nozzles. I've either got to slow down to put on the normal amount of, of rate or re-nozzle. We have another question and it is, what is the recommendation for thinning if we have used promalin? Okay, promalin on a warm year will give some thinning, but on a cool year like this one, it gives no thinning. It does change shape. So it really doesn't change the number of flowers out there. I've done a number of tests with promalin over the years and one year out of five, I get thinning when it's warm. But I expect that there will be absolutely no thinning from the promalin this year. So you should go forward on the thinning program like as if that hadn't happened. It will help the shape, but it really won't change the thinning. And this year, I think. Terrence, if I could expand on that question, what if the promalin or perlan was used in terms of frost mitigation? So, you know, the aim was, was to set part carpic fruit. How would that change the thinning equation? So that's an excellent question also. Where we've had frost damage and you're trying to set even a minimal crop with promalin, and I was part of that. It was a group project of North Carolina, us in New York, and I can't remember who else, but we had excellent results, but we could never get a full crop this work was primarily done in 2012 when we had widespread frost damage all over the state. But it did save the crop back up to a 60% level. So in that case, we didn't have enough flowers to do anything. So after we sprayed that promalin for rescue, we didn't do any more thinning. Now, this requires a very good assessment of what's out there. That's why if you sprayed promalin to rescue your crop, uh, and you just barely have enough fruit, don't do anything. But if you still have a lot of fruit, then you can go forth as if it wouldn't really impact the thinning. We have another question. Do you have any suggestions for analyzing damage and thinning assessments in an orchard that has 20 plus culinary varieties and no large plantings of any varieties? Well, it, yeah, that's a problem uh, where there's so many varieties. I think we know over the years that Empire and Delicious are sensitive to frost. So I would start with those two varieties and assess what's happened there. We know that Honeycrisp tends to come through the frost better. And so I would go to that variety if it was in the mix to see the other extreme. And then all the other varieties would be somewhere in the middle. Generally, Gala comes through well but it appears from the data that Donna has taken that it's not doing that well this year. I still think there's probably a decent crop of gala out there. But then you have to try, if you're gonna put thinner on, you have to try to target the varieties where you might need some thinning, like Honeycrisp, but probably Fuji, 
but you have to totally stay away from the really sensitive varieties to frost like Empire and Red Delicious. Now, if that's not possible because everything's mixed up, then you just do on a very light rate, just put seven alone and then just try to fix it with hand thinning later. Thank you. We have one final question. If we are past ATS option for a Fuji block that warrants a bloom spray, would you prefer NAD over NAA? Yeah, that's a challenging question because Fuji is very sensitive to either NAA or NAD and pygmy fruit. And so it's not a variety I like to uh, put NAA on ever, but if I had only those two choices, I would choose NAD over NAA. But we've also had good success putting on Maxell at Bloom on Fuji, if it's warm. If it's cold, it's like throwing your money away. It doesn't do anything. So my first choice on Fuji would be to put on some Maxell at Bloom. My second choice would be to put on NAD at Bloom. And I would never put on NA. Okay, I think that wraps it up for all of our questions. Thank you, Terrence. Okay. We will now hear from Peter Jensch. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to begin sharing my screen straight away. And I have two uh, screens up, actually. The one on the right is a PowerPoint presentation, and the one on the left is, is basically an overview of some of the pest management decision making we'll need to make in the near future. Can you guys hear me okay? And I will assume that's a yes. So I'll keep yes, going. Yes, it's good. Okay. So uh, beginning with the screen on the left, uh, we still have Lore's band available until 2021. And using Lore's band uh, as, as soon as possible, if you haven't used it already, and certainly not during bloom and not while pollinators are pollinators are out. It should have already been used, but you still can use it uh, shortly after bloom. The longer you wait to use it, the more problematic it becomes with regards to volatility, moving up into apples and possibly having residue on apples if it tends to be a, a drought season um, at harvest. And so um, there are other options and we're moving toward that in a very big way with regards to mating disruption for dogwood borer. However, for black stem borer, using it at first cover if black stem borer one has been found on your farm you're using traps to catch it and in the recent past it's caused injury uh, to your trees then lore's band is a a good option probably one of the better options it's very difficult to um, to really get the material on the tree unless you're spraying it in a coarse trunk spray and a lot of growers just have a challenge um, making those applications using it in uh, in a designated sprayer for trunks is probably uh, one, one of the things that allows Lohr's band to be highly effective, uh, especially for spraying both sides of the tree. So the Phil Brown sprayer is something that I've talked about in years past. It's an excellent choice. So we, we really have a number of insects that are on the horizon. And plum curculio is the one that most people are referred to as the insect that they need to control. However, Rosy apple aphid, the lepidopteran complex, including oriental fruit moth, lesser apple worm, tufted apple bud moth, and in some locations, spotted tenniform leaf mire can still be a problem. Uh, materials for, for those are specific to the lep complex. Um, and with regards to, uh, you know, plant bug, that's, boy, season by season, that insect can become devastating. You can see upwards to well over 10% uh, plant bug injury, and that's a broad spectrum of, of insects, but primarily tarnished plant bug that can cause problems. Now, I have to say the caveat here is the cool wet weather and primarily the cool weather has really kept the lid on almost all insects in the orchard up to this point. So cold temperatures uh, do not favor insect activity, certainly not feeding. Um, development has been uh, probably on target or relatively slow but we're turning the corner on that and I'll, I'll discuss that in a second. The, the unpredictable insects that we have to deal with recently are codling moth. Codling moth seems to be making a comeback. 
And so applications really geared for first cover, second cover, um, shortly after pedal fall is something you need to keep an eye on if you've had pack out injury in the past. Now, lots of growers have had collie moth injury in the mid Hudson Valley, and it's not something I would overlook. Oblique banded leaf roller, on the other hand, which had been problematic uh, during the late 90s all the way through 2000, uh, we have a much better handle on that given the diversity of our, our lepidopterin complex in, uh, insecticides. Uh, we're not going to get into brown marmorated stink bug quite yet, but we have seen injury in the past on, on stone fruit, primarily peaches, uh, early season. It's really a late season insect pest, and that's something we'll keep an eye out for a little later. Woolly apple aphid is another one that's sort of popping up here and there. We use a lot of pyrethroids late in the season for BMSB management. Woolly apple aphid tends to do really well when we eliminate, through the use of pyrethroids, a lot of the parasitoids. So there's a specific parasitoid for woolly apple aphid, and it seems to have made a comeback given the fact that there's no biological control going on in the orchards. A big problem for many wholesale growers. San Jose scale, again, this is an insect that can be controlled early season with oil, uh, oil and esteem, esteem alone. There's lots of options, everything from uh, venerate, which is an anti-feedant, but it does work well on San Jose scale. That's more of an organic material to many of our standards like uh, centaur. Ambrosia beetle, as I mentioned earlier, the black, black stem borers, um, you know, one of these insects that we really can't get a handle on in terms of uh, predicting whether or not it's going to be a problem. Uh, Dan has done a tremendous job uh, trapping throughout the region. Uh, Art in Yellow in Western New York, we're finding amb Ambrosia beetles all over the place. It's just not predictable year to year. Um, certainly conditions that favor uh, heavy rains, standing water in orchards um, put the trees into much more stress and so as they put out that ethylene as a response to stress ambrosia beetle black stem borer in particular find the trees and, and begin to burrow in given their weakened state and then lastly lep uh, leopard moth can be problematic in some orchards usually long island um, we see it here or there in in trees that are not um, intensively managed so that said i'm switching over now to uh, to the PowerPoint, I'm going to share a, a full screen. So what we're seeing as of this afternoon in some of the John of Gold, everything from pink, late pink, early bloom, king bloom here in the middle picture, and full bloom as we move on. Today was an ideal day for pollination. However, we're moving into some overcast skies, rain. Uh, we might have a day or two in the next five days for, for additional pollination, but as we move past that, it gets cold again, and bees just do not like cold, rainy weather. This is our forecast, really, for the next few days. We've had some low temperatures that kept everything at bay, but now nighttime low temperatures in the 50s, Friday 80 degrees, Saturday 73, then 68, 61 on through Monday. That's going to prompt plum curculio and lots of other insects to begin really moving into apple if they're migrating or from within as endemic orchards, as endemic insects in your orchard begin to start moving. So keep an eye on the orchards. And certainly if you have a sentinel tree like a cherry tree um, or more particular plum, which plum peculio favor, especially early in the season, Japanese plums are their favorite. If you have these trees that are not yet sprayed, keep an eye on them because they are likely to be the first hit. Lots of our uh, tree fruit, our apples have begun to set fruit. It's only when the, the king or the laterals begin to turn the corner five millimeters or larger where they become vulnerable. And from what I've seen, relatively few varieties are really quite there yet. But over the next few days, they certainly will be given the warmer temperatures. So that said, Donna mentioned and, and uh, Terrence just recently, the browning injury that you should be looking for in your varieties to help you with decision making. I'm not going to go on to, to anything but that, but just to show you these pictures that you can do this. You can cut some apples open. You can see the browning. It's very straightforward. Uh, there's a lot of science behind that, but if you're just looking for browning, it'll let you know whether or not these, uh, these fruitlets are going to be viable, right? So moving into honeybees, if the honeybee uh, folks that have dropped their, their colonies off at your farm are knocking on your door saying, yeah, we want to move these up to Maine to get the blueberries going. 
put your hands on the rain. Try to get as much time as possible with honeybees because they really have not done, from what I can tell, as good a job as we need them to do given the fact we have a lot of compromised food out there. So if there's flowers opening up that are still viable, we need pollination. So just an overview on some honeybees, only a third of the honeybees really are out there searching or foraging. They're either doing nectar or pollen, but usually not both. 50% of those honeybees tend to be pollen collectors. So if you have 60 bees in a hive, uh, 60,000 bees in a hive, you've got yourself only 30 bees out there. Half of those 15,000 bees are actually uh, collecting pollen. And that's what you're looking for, are bees to be able to work for you on that level. Uh, honeybees will not forage uh, until the temperatures really get up above 65 degrees. We haven't had many of those days, and we're moving into low intensity light conditions where bees just don't like to, uh, to then forage. In windy conditions, which we're gonna see tomorrow, greater than 50 miles an hour, basically stops all foraging. So, simply at 50 degrees, they're not moving. At 65 degrees, you got 100% of the bees out doing what they need to do. So that said, if you have, or if you have honeybees out, we really needed to double up this year on the number of hives we have. You know, if we're looking at 20,000 bees basically per acre of fruit, we needed to double that because during a cold, wet spring, when the weather conditions are just limiting for bees, they're just not going to be as active. So that could be a problem. Uh, pollinizers, you know, this is a year where you wished you kind of had more pollinizers or have alternate rows with different varieties to help with the pollination. Bees tend to work up and down the road. They don't cross the road very much. And so that tends to, uh, to limit the amount of pollinization that's occurring. So to move then into the pesticides uh, that we need for pest management, there are specific pesticides that can poison honeybees and cause death, lack of foraging, abnormal behavior, poor brood development, and so on. And the, the beekeepers will end up with dead broods and, and queenless hives in that case. So we want to absolutely at all costs preserve our, our pollinizers, pollinizers. So that said, all pesticides really fall into four different categories based on pollinator safety. And taking a minute just to become familiar with this might help with decision making as we move forward. If we're moving into a situation now where we got uh, warm conditions poor pollinization, and we might need to get an application on for European apple sawfly or some of the other insects I mentioned, predominantly plum curculio, then there are insecticides that we can put out during bloom or uh, under certain constraints to allow us to protect what fruit we now have. So, as I said, in, in these four classes, there's one class, class four, that has undergone long-term studies looking at brood, looking at various um, aspects of these active ingredients uh, across replicated sites. And these in insecticides in this class were found to be um, uh, not hazardous <laughs> to honeybees at any time of blooming crops and carry no application constraints during bloom. So it's it not found to be hazardous, thank you. Um, However, that said, given the fact you, you might have an insecticide that's not hazardous at all, if you put it in with a certain adjuvant or in with a fungicide, you get an interaction and sometimes synergy that can really cause that combination to become extremely toxic. So in that case, understanding that, that, uh, that synergy is really important. So one example I'll list here, propionyl butoxide. It inhibits the detoxification of an insecticide by an insect. So when you want to kill insects, using PBO is what would be an ideal situation. We use it in pairs, especially if we want to use pyrethroids to kill paracilla. However, you put this in a tank mix uh, with non-toxic products and it induces toxicity in the honeybees because the bees cannot detoxify. That said, here are the, here's a list of the insecticides that you can use during bloom, and that includes Altacor. So in the orchard now, our oblique banded leaf roller, oriental fruit moth, if they become problematic, this would be an option. There's almost no mite activity out there. Between the rain and the cold weather, I haven't seen a single European red mite. However, in your blocks, on your sites, they may be overwintering in high populations. 
Apollo's an option. For obliques specifically, Bacillus thuringiensis, a great product for obliques, especially used in low light conditions, multiple applications over five days, using lower rates. That's the way to use Bacillus thuringiensis during bloom. Belief is a, is a new active ingredient, flanicamide. It's really quite good during this period of time on tarnished plant bug. It's really the only material that, that's a go-to for tarnished plant bug. For scale, esteem, Again, a number of other materials for oblique, like Intrepid, and uh, you can see the list here, lots of uh, miticides that you can use. When we move into the next class, class three, you can use these materials if temperatures fall below 50 degrees all day, so colder temperatures, so the bees aren't flying, and you have low uh, relative humidity, so you have fast dry time. So if the temperature is above 50, you don't spray until the temperature drops below 50, which is usually after 7 p.m., and then you stop spraying in the morning after 7 a.m. So these include a sale for mullein plant bugs. Some of you have had problems with that, especially in Red Delicious. And here's probably one of the more important materials, Avant, used for plum curculio. There's other materials that um, I'm not going to recommend, but I think you've got plenty of options there with regards to materials to use for insecticides. Dan? Where am I with time, or Sarah? Am I done? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we do need to, to move on. Yes, and I just here's a quick image of a plum curculio that I caught in one of our black stem borer traps. So they are along the periphery of, of the orchard. So thank you very much for your attention. I don't think I have much time for questions, but um, you can certainly email me or call myself. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, we don't currently have any questions. Um, thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Surgeon Achimovich. Okay. So let me just go and share my screen. And uh, we're going to just uh, cover uh, really quickly uh, what's the status of the diseases so far uh, in the valley. And uh, so this has been a really tough year, as, as you have heard from other people. And uh, there's several issues that I want to go and talk about um, in this specific uh, um, year. And the first is, you know, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, whether a certain number of spores can cause a scab infection or not. And I just, uh, in this uh, first part of the handout that you see here, that I made for this meeting, you can see a table from a new uh, website that shows actually apple scab infection events from uh, March 1st till, till uh, several days ago. And I highlighted with a, a red rectangles, um, and then next to the rectangles, you, you can see on the left side the um, amount of the ascospores that were uh, uh, involved in, in triggering these infections. And, um, you know, it just uh, wanted, you know, just, just to show you that in this specific year with the cold conditions, you know, you can have an infection uh, with anything from 1% and less than 1% of ascospores released up to 16% in the case of the major infection period that we had in, um, on, on April 30th. So that go also goes to, to say uh, something about the carryover inoculum that you have from the previous year. So the March 28th uh, infection you see at the bottom, the re uh, red rectangle you see at the bottom, March 28th, um, this was the infection that was, um, you know, caused by less than 1%, but that would be an infection that we would probably have to protect with fungicides in orchards that had high inoculum pressure from last year. So basically orchards that you knew you had issues with scab last year, uh, something snuck up on you and you didn't apply that fungicide and allowed some, some scab to set in, then you know even one percent might uh, might be a, a cause for infection in this uh, current year, and you would have to protect against it. In in the scab clean orchards from last year, you would not need to protect against this infection on March 28th because the inoculum spore load would be much uh, much less because there was also less carried over uh, from last year. So in that regard, um, you know on the on the uh, April 30th. That's where the major infection period was for both the orchards that were scab clean um, from last year and also the orchards that, that had scab last year. I have uh, put an image here that we detected the first symptoms a couple of days ago uh, at, the val at the lab. So then we always have uh, unsprayed trees there and we can look at 
those to see when the infection um, you know, has, been, has shown up as lesions. And in this specific case, uh, what I uh, wanted to just uh, tell you is that most likely because the cold conditions, these lesions that you see on this image on the right, and they're basically the top part of the image, uh, those two smudge uh, gray spots that you see with a little bit of yellowing there, they most likely have been initiated in, and in this, is, this is a section of the orchard that we have high inoculum pressure carryover from the last year. So these were most likely initiated on March 28th, they had those infections. So it took them a long time to go through the process of incubation to actually show these symptoms. So not only that the trees have slowed in their development, but also the pathogen as well, uh, after it, it reached um, and you know, the, uh, the defenses of the plant and infected. So, if, so that's, that's one highlight that I would like to just uh, make sure that I tell you. And uh, what we also noticed is that on all three varieties that we have in this block, is unsprayed on Jersey Mac, Golden, Golden Delicious, and Redford, we have seen symptoms. So it seems that, you know, there's no that offset between cultivars. We have seen symptoms in all three varieties. So I'm going to now talk about the, uh, the number of these infections in a more different uh, uh, way. So this is a visual output from the RIMPRO apple scab model. So we have uh, 24 uh, different apple farms in eastern New York that use this RIMPRO model. And one thing that I wish to um, just give you a, a, just a brief uh, um, you know, rundown how this model works. The model has the ability to actually predict uh, which percentage of the ascospores that are released. So the white, these white humps that you see here are the actual cumulative number of the ascospores that are released for each rain event. And only that, okay, if you have white hump and then the red line followed from that white hump, then the red line is, and, and how high that red line goes, um, you know, shows you the amount of those ascospores that got released that did cause the infection. And right off the bat on this image, you can just see in this um, uh, blue rectangle that I put there, there has been a number of ascospore uh, releases uh, with no presence of any infection at that time. So this is the, that, this is the advantage of this model. The, the model has the ability to tell you whether after the ascospores have landed in uh, and on the leaves and, and in the uh, droplets, whether they have proper conditions for the germ tube from, that, from those ascospores to actually you know, germinate and actually penetrate the leaf and cause the infection. So we have here roughly eight of these uh, 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 false flags, I would say, for, for fungicide sprays, whereas the first one was on, on uh, uh, March 28th that I mentioned to you, and this one, you know, uh, was basically, are you still hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Something happened, I'm not sure what. So, um, so what I was basically trying to, to mention to you is that if you look at this infection here, on, on, uh, which is on your left side on March 28th, that would be the infection you would uh, have to apply a fungicide if you did have ask, well, if you did have scab last year in your orchard. So for all the other commercial orchards that did not have scab last year, you would not react for anything that is um, um, at this magnitude at 100 or just above 100 rim value. So we look at how high this red line goes. In this case, it just went over, uh, over 100. So in, in, this would be only a fungicide warranted uh, infection uh, that, you know, in the scab dirty orchards from last year. And you can see um, uh, that basically uh, in, uh, in, in all the other or orchards that did not have scab last year, the first major infection happened on 30th uh, April. Uh, and that also coincided with warm weather as well. So, so that's that. That's the highlights from from this. Uh, from from th this is the way how this, uh, the the year looked like. Okay, and um, you know I will be definitely willing. To, I'm going to post this uh, uh, handout on my blog so you can download it to examine it in more detail in the future. I also overlaid the growth stages, and you can see how long it took uh, apple trees to go and you know switch to these stages that we would normally. In a normal year, you know, we'll switch in, in, in a matter of, of weeks or, or, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, one week or two weeks. So I'm going to switch to show you the amount of rain that we got. And then this uh, purple rectangle here down 
focuses your attention to the amount of these small blue curvy lines that you see above the dates that I listed out there. So, you know, I was thinking if there's going to be ever a more difficult year from 2017, and, you know, long behold, this is one of those years. First of all, it was very, uh, the temperature is very low, and that's the red line that you see up there, but the amount of rains, basically, we did not have a week with, with, with at least two rain events uh, that occurred. So it, that is when you really know um, that you have to invest in your fungicides, and they have to be um, really dispersed well, uh, starting from pink up until petal fall, because at that time, you have to narrow down your spray interval to be able to have clean fruit and, uh, and leaves from, from the scab. So this is one of those years where you'll see the payoff from your fungicides. And you know, in, the, in this specific case, um, you know, the, you know, there's going to be a lot of, you know, I hope there's not going to be a lot of mistakes, but you know, you'll, you'll, know, you'll see the effect um, of, of really investing in the fungicides in this year. So, so that's the other highlight I want to sh show you. And then I'm going to switch now to just give you some take home messages in terms of the uh, scab. First of all, uh, we, did, we detected ascospores on uh, March 20th. And depending on their number that, that we found them on the uh, scab spore tower, uh, when they started shooting out from the leaf litter, we basically in the Hudson Valley recommended a biofix date between 16th to 30th March, depending on location. So more northern locations would have the biofix date towards the 30th March, whereas more south locations would set their biofix on the 16th and, and uh, uh, dates around that. So this is an important point for Rimpro users and also for the newer users of the SCAB model because it recalibrates both, both models to work more correctly, give more correct predictions. We did not have infections, at least in the orchards that were uh, scab clean up until 30th April. So the cold weather did not really also play in favor of the scab so far as well. But from pink on, so right about the time of pink in the, in the lower Hudson Valley, which actually was around 30th April, we got the first major infection. And from this point on, with the rain that we, we are getting, you know, that, that there's going to be a lot of challenges with scab this year because we found the first symptoms on 11th May. So the fungus is, is just keeping up with the regular time when we, ever, when we all also see scab in regular years as well. Um, and um, cold weather really did not favor scab, as I said, but it also did not favor rust. We didn't see the symptoms of rust yet on, on apples. We're expecting to see them with more warm weather coming in, but the rain is gonna definitely favor the calyx sand rot and the black rot and white rot. And most likely, if, it, if this trend continues, the bitter rot, because the infections for bitter rot most likely happen during bloom time. So in the capital region, uh, what we also saw is that uh, there is uh, new infection uh, periods, and also for the, for the valley as well, there's new infection periods uh, predicted for 15th and 17th May for scab, and they're gonna be major infection periods. So you have, you know, I, I hope you applied your fungicides, you know, today or, or a couple of days before, so, you know, be ready to cover if you didn't to cover with a, with a kickback activity fungicide after uh, these rain events that are going to, um, you know, just hit us in the next several days. The most important uh, uh, discussion I've had with multiple growers in, in the East um, uh, New York is whether and how much we should uh, go and discuss when is the primary scab season going to happen. Well, RIMPRO has the ability uh, because it's a dynamic model, it actually follows the groups of spores in their development mechanistically. So ba basically it means that every stage in the growth of, in, and release of the ascospores and the growth of the germ tube is accounted in that model. It gives you the ability to dynamically follow, you know, at which time of the day or night the ascospores are being released or not. And one, that's really impressive because it gives you the ability to, um, you know, to see how these infections are gonna progress or not. And one thing that is really also cool with this model is that it has the ability to predict how many of ascospores are still remaining in the leaf litter to, to discharge. And at this point, uh, somewhere around Milton and uh, Marlboro, we're around between, I would say, nine to 18% of the ascospores still remaining in the leaf litter to be released. And, um, that number goes above when you go more north towards um, Red Hook and Germantown and uh, uh, Altamont, New York, and it ends up being around 50% still in Bennington, Vermont, 
which is just north of, of Alcamont, New York, in terms of the latitude. And we are having around 35 to 49 percent of the ASCOS portion in the discharge as more north you go. So the this, this SCAD primary season is not yet ending. Uh, we'll see how much of the ASCOS pores are going to be released with the rains that are coming on the, on the 15th and 17th May. So be ready to be covered for that time. And just to uh, give you a comparison with the maturity model in the NUA uh, chart, we already have now that 90%, 95% of the ASCO spores based on the model for maturity of the spores in the leaf litter in NUA it all, has already happened on May 12th. And it, it, clearly that's not the case because, because the RIMPRO model has uh, this more fine-tuned model to predict how many ASCO spores are still remaining there. So I would trust more in this case the RIMPRO than the NUA model. So you definitely have to keep up your spray still more for some time. And I'm going to report that through the blogs. And then the other topic that has been uh, pretty much a, a constant topic over the phone calls is the fire blight. We have not had a favorable conditions for fire blight infection yet in the valley and in the capital region, especially not in the northern uh, New York where you know the bloom just started on the very early varieties. So uh, we have not fulfilled the three key conditions for fire blight to infect. And um, I'm just showing you here output from new faults that is close to us as an average uh, of, out of all farms that I uh, follow every day. We have only reached 68 uh, EIP value or um, infection potential or epiphytic infection potential by the, by the fire blight pathogen. It just got to 68 here on May 3rd. That was the closest that it would be something that we would maybe, um, you know, just be a little bit worried about. We don't worry up until the point that this number uh, switches to 100. And basically, um, so in, in this specific case, that has not happened at that time. But um, yesterday, I have been watching at the model, and we see some predictions on some locations that this number, uh, basically on uh, uh, May 15th and 16th, might approach 100. But it has to have all three conditions fulfilled, and that is that you have enough inoculum on, on the flowers. So that means that the heat units, which this uh, model in incorporates, that number, EAP number, is actual number that shows you how conducive the weather so far was in terms of the heat to allow the pathogen to grow populations of flowers. It needs to have rain event or wetting event that allows pathogen to be washed down in, in the nectar glands. And the temperature um, has to, ever to, be at, to be on average uh, above 60 Fahrenheit. And so, so in some locations, we have already reached, for instance, the 100 value, it's just, just one location so far, and that's Campbell Hall and Walden, but we did not, we don't have a prediction of um, the infection to, to, uh, to occur. And so far, you see here that for the prediction here on the right side, uh, that we are predicting there is 6% chance for rain uh, during the night and 5% chance for rain uh, on on, uh, on during the day. So I don't think that there's gonna be, um, you know, conducive conditions for fire blight, but you should, you know, stay on top of things because we are gonna have these warm days that Peter mentioned in, in, in his expose. So, you know, just watch at the model every day to see, you know, what's gonna happen. But we don't really uh, worry about, um, uh, up until this, uh, this field here for EIP changes to 100 and also becomes red colored, and that means that you know, rain is going to happen and trigger the infection at that time. I'm just going to show you one other uh, comparison of this model from NUA, which basically uh, is the merit light model. I'm going to compare it now to the slide down there, which is basically your, your output from RIMPRO. And uh, this is just one location in which I've seen this red curved line that you see on the top. And I basically highlighted the infection that is in this purple uh, rectangle down there just shows you that infection apparently occurred on, uh, on May 8th in Claverack. Um, but, you know, this model, even though it is provided through the cluster of models in RIMPRO, it does just, just is relatively new and it doesn't seem to be um, that in tune yet with the newer model. And um, even though you're seeing this as an infection, uh, the, the inventor of this model keeps on telling us that usually the first infection the model predicts is usually not something that you know you should be worried about 
it's just a model that seems to overestimate. So, so I would trust more the NUA model outputs that I've just showed you. So if you have any questions for me, I would be more than willing to, to answer those questions here now. I don't see any questions. Um... Okay, good. I mean, I have received a lot of them on the phone or the texts and emails in recent days. So feel free to stay in contact with me. I'm going to post this handout on the blog tonight. So you'll, you'll be able to read it, read more into it. Thank you, Surgeon. Um, can we turn yeah. it over to uh, Donna Achimovic? Okay, sure. sure. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So I'll be really uh, brief since I have only a few minutes. Uh, we had a really rough start uh, with this season. Uh, we already seen uh, frost. Uh, we had a couple of frost events and this season really reminds of uh, 2016, uh, though I hope it's not going to remind us of 2016 in terms of uh, uh, sunburn uh, damages we saw in 2016. Uh, so here I'm going to just show you uh, how uh, an average uh, year uh, looks like. Uh, and that was 2019. Uh, it was an, uh, an average year in terms of uh, uh, heat accumulation and uh, precipitation. Uh, and during that uh, year, we had uh, uh, in total 20 uh, days when uh, our temperature reached uh, over, uh, reached or went over uh, 31 uh, Celsius or uh, 86 uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, that would be the threshold uh, where, uh, Above, uh, so that's the temperature uh, when uh, the requirement for sunburn damages uh, are for, uh, fulfilled, uh, and you would probably uh, see some sunburn damage uh, on the uh, fruits that has been uh, totally exposed uh, to the sun uh, for a longer a longer period of time, uh, on the, uh, and the air temperature is uh, above uh, 86 uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, so uh, that year, uh, we saw an, an average uh, 10 uh, to 12 uh, percent of sunburn uh, damage in our untreated controls. Uh, so the trees that haven't received any uh, sunburn tr uh, treatments. Uh, we usually see uh, 10, uh, 10 to 20 percent of sunburn damages on our trees, uh, with the exception of 2016 uh, when we saw. Uh, 40% of sunburn damages. Uh, and that season, we also had uh, almost 40 days uh, where the, when the uh, maximum uh, daily temperature reached uh, or went above uh, 31 or 86 uh, Fahrenheit. 31 Celsius or 86 uh, uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll uh, just shortly uh, went over uh, all strategies we have tried uh, since 2015, and that would include uh, over the row uh, netting, uh, overhead irrigation. Uh, we also had over the uh, tree nettings, uh, our uh, drape net trials, uh, and we uh, tested a couple of uh, spray products, uh, and uh, most of them are particle fills, uh, fill on the, on the uh, uh, fruit surface. Uh, which would uh, reflect sunlight and in that way reduce uh, 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 heating up the uh, fruit service, uh, surface. Uh, so uh, here's the um, table uh, with all our products tested uh, with their active ingredients, rates, and timing when we apply those treatments. And uh, I'm just gonna uh, tell you briefly what works uh, work the best. Uh, although we haven't found perfect strategy uh, for uh, some treatments that, that we have an excellent results in reducing summer damages, we also had really uh, bad results uh, and those treatments really negatively affected, uh, for example, fruit quality, like uh, color development. Uh, so uh, I'll start first with the uh, over the row netting, uh, which gives us excellent results, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, it definitely reduced uh, fruit color. Uh, ev uh, evaporated pooling uh, had uh, a reasonable uh, success rate, uh, 
uh, and it was similar with the uh, Renux uh, Plus. Uh, we didn't uh, see uh, much success uh, applying uh, Screen Duo, uh, so I, 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 that's my least uh, favorite uh, treatment. Uh, we also saw uh, good results with Surround uh, and Shade, uh, and those two uh, products had uh, similar results like uh, white uh, draped nets. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using black draped nets for uh, our region. Uh, because it really uh, affects negatively uh, yield per tree, uh, uh, fruit size, uh, and, uh, and the color. Uh, so with this, I'll just, uh, oops, uh, I'll just uh, tell something more about the use of uh, white uh, drape nets uh, and compare uh, the results uh, we got to the uh, to the untreated control. Uh, why we look more at the white drape nets is because uh, they have multiple uh, beneficial effects. It's not only that it's used for the sunburn pro uh, protection, it's also used for hail protection. Uh, from uh, it, it protects trees from the pest uh, damages. Uh, such as birds, bats, and we uh, had a, a nice success uh, in the protection uh, in the uh, against the um, late season um, uh, uh, apple insect uh, complex. Uh, so here you can see our uh, uh, treatments uh, compared to untreated controls uh, on different varieties. We tested uh, six different varieties and. Uh, Here's the table, uh, what, which will tell you which variety uh, responded the best uh, to white nets. Uh, and among uh, all of six, uh, I uh, noticed that New York One uh, had the best uh, response in terms of color. Uh, in, in that variety, color was even improved. Uh, we also had uh, reasonable success in uh, Honeycrisp and uh, Empire didn't have uh, any uh, uh, reaction to <laughs> drape net. They, we got the similar results like in the uh, untreated control. Uh, however, on the other hand, we have uh, Gala uh, and uh, New York 2 and Fuji, uh, which uh, are varieties that really don't go well with the uh, wide drape, the drape nets. Uh, dr uh, nets would uh, negatively affect yield per tree, uh, would negatively affect uh, sugar accumulation and uh, color development in those three, uh, three uh, cultivars. So with this, I'll finish my presentation. I'll be uh, more happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. We don't have any questions at this time, so we'll move on and uh, we'll hear from Meg Face down now. Okay. All right, thank you, Sarah. And hello, everybody. Just give me a second and I'll go ahead and share my presentation. Um, so today, can everybody see my presentation all right? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I'm just going to quickly review uh, some post-bloom weed management strategies with you all today. So as we know, May through July is really the critical weed-free period in the orchard. That's generally when we're getting a lot of shoot growth, a lot of fruit growth. Uh, so there's a lot of competition there for water, light, and nutrients. So this is really that critical time where we want to be making sure we have our weeds under control. And then certainly later in the season as well, uh, weeds can be problematic then uh, certainly weeds can impede our later herbicide applications. They can also provide habitat for pests and they can also interfere with our harvest management. So as far as the 2020 season has gone so far, you know, hopefully in the pre-bloom period gave you an opportunity to get some residual materials out in your orchards. Uh, hopefully they're, they're still holding fairly effective for you. Uh, but as we go through in the next few weeks, you know, really keeping an eye on your herbicide strip and seeing what's growing uh, so you can plan your post-emergent strategies. And I really recommend as you're, you're out in the orchard, you know, just keeping a general eye on the species diversity that you have in the herbicide strip and in the sod, see what growth habits are present and also what growth stages they're also present at. So now I'm just gonna really quickly talk about some of the main materials that we can be using uh, post-emergent. Uh, paraquat certainly is a very commonly used one. 
Uh, this is a contact material. It's going to burn back the tissues, and because of that, it needs good coverage. Generally, we want to put that on while the weeds are still small. As far as what we're controlling with Paraquat, you know, it's, it's a fairly broad spectrum material, uh, mostly for annual use, annual broadleaves, annual grasses, not as effective at all on perennials. The group 14s, uh, these are also other contact materials. Some of the common tray names for these are AIM, Trevix, and Venue. And again, these are going to be contact. So with these materials, we want to get them on early when the weeds are small because they're going to be burning back uh, the vegetation that's present. Oftentimes, we'll use these materials in a tank mix with a systemic material like glyphosate. Uh, what that'll do is we'll allow the glyphosate to do its job, uh, but we'll allow for faster burn down of those pre-emerged weeds. Some things to keep in mind with some of these different materials are the age restrictions that they're under. And certainly, you know, with really all the herbicides, the most that we can do to, to keep them off of the green foliage and off of the the immature trunks is, is really important uh, in terms of tree health and keeping the trunks free from damage. So now I'll shift over to some of our systemic materials. Glyphosate, uh, again, systemic, it's going to actually be disrupting the plant growth. Very broad spectrum, a lot of our annual grasses and broadleaves and also uh, a commonly used material for dealing with those perennials as well. So timing for glyphosate is really, really important. Uh, we want to apply this material when those perennial weeds are healthy and actively growing, uh, but we also want to minimize the potential for injury to our trees. So it's important to get this material on preferably by early July and even earlier in dry years. In dry years, we want to get it on you know, preferably by mid to late June. And the reason for that is, you know, the, the trees are going to be taking up that glyphosate if it hits the, the tree at all. And generally, uh, there's going to be more translocation of these materials from the tree into the roots during the fall when it's starting to put away its, its carbohydrate reserves. And then we'll see that injury the following spring when the trees start pushing back out uh, from their reserves to the foliage. So we would expect to see injury from glyphosate, not necessarily this year, but in the, the next growing season. I also want to just point out that peaches are extremely sensitive to, to glyphosate um, and a general recommendation for using glyphosate is not to apply it to trees that don't have mature bark yet or trees that aren't yet to third leaf. Then I'll cover the auxinic herbicides. So two of the main ones here are 2,4-D and clopyrrolid. Uh, some common names, unison and weed are for 2,4-D. Uh, for clopyrrolid, stinger, or spur. So again, like glyphosate, these are systemic materials. Uh, they're a bit more selective compared to glyphosate. Generally, we're going to be treating broad leaves with these materials. So for T4D, as far as timing for this one goes, uh, generally recommended late fall because it's a very volatile herbicide. Uh, and that'll be really useful for cleaning up dandelions and other broad leaves that are going to be in our row middles. So this is a very common use for T4D. The main restrictions, we don't want to be applying this to bare ground or on light sandy soils, and we want to apply it to trees that are at least one year old. And then for stinger, this is an, another common material. Again, uh, specific to broad leaves. And for this one, the timing is, again, when those weeds are going to be small and actively growing. Uh, the fall application, again, is, is commonly used for thistle control. This will also control some of the other main legumes, like our clovers, nightshades, and uh, dandelions as well. And again, another restriction for stinger is at least one year old for the application. Then I'll just leave up this the summary here uh, with some of the other post-emergent materials that are available to us um, and some of the general restrictions and what their primary selectivity is. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, or feel free to call or email me anytime. Thank you, Mike. Um, now we're going to move on to Dan Donahue. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just going to make a few comments about bitter pit management and Honeycrisp. Um, first off, nitrogen management. You know, we're already pretty much past that stage. I think growers in eastern New York are doing an excellent, excellent job in moderating 
their nitrogen uses. I can tell you that average shoot growth in our test Honeycrisp blocks is about 11, terminal shoot growth about 11 inches a year, which is pretty moderate. So that's good, we're doing great on nitrogen. Uh, Lei Ling Cheng has um, come to our fruit schools a number of times. He's talked about potassium. He's done a lot of work with uh, Mario Miranda Sazo out in Western New York. And they've come to the conclusion that moderating the use of potassium is good in terms of moderating bitter pit. So keep that in mind as you go into the future. Uh, at our pruning demonstration back in mid-March, uh, Terrence had made the comment that he's done some analysis of some survey data in his program and likes uh, to keep the pH in Honeycrisp blocks up around seven. So again, in your liming programs, keep that in mind. But what can you do now to help this season? So if you're Albany to the south, at this point, uh, you already had your chance to put on a single shot of Apogee at pink, which we have shown uh, will suppress bitter pit uh, to some extent. And if you're north of Albany and you're moving into the pink stage, you still have that opportunity to do that. Uh, this is good for mature blocks. Even a single early application does reduce uh, shoot extension. And of course, you don't wanna do that uh, in, your, in your young uh, Honeycrisp blocks that have to fill space. Next, foliar calcium. I've never seen a topic that offers more heat than light than discussing foliar calcium. For me, it's timing that's important. If I had five sprays in my spray budget for foliar calcium, what would I do? I would start those five sprays at petal fall, and I would spray weekly for the five weeks through the cell mitosis period. If I wanted to spend more money on calcium, then I would apply additional sprays through the summer, maybe stretching the interval out to 10 to 14 days at that point until I've spent as much money as I was comfortable with. If uh, I wanna put something on a little bit earlier, some growers are experimenting with uh, pink, uh, starting at pink and, and through bloom. I have no problem with that. I also have no data, but I don't see an issue. And again, getting early calcium out there, I think is a good idea. So what if you take all these steps? You do everything right. Unfortunately, you're still gonna see some bitter pit. And I, I'm sorry for that, but that's the biology of this particular variety. So let's talk about plain old avoidance. So if you can determine in a given block how much bitter pit you're going to experience out of cold storage later in the year, then perhaps you could make a decision as to whether you should put that block into storage or sell it out of the orchard or uh, earlier in the marketing season. So we use uh, prediction models to do that. A lot of work going on with prediction models. So here in the East, we have a, a New York Farm Viability Project. We're going into the second year now. It's a development and validation project to test two bitter pit prediction models. The first model is one developed by Yosef El Shaf and Chris Watkins. It's called the passive prediction model, where you pick a sample uh, out of a particular orchard and um, 120, 140 apples, and you put those apples in the office and you hold them at room temperature. And the day before you're ready to start harvest, so this is three weeks later, you pick this sample three weeks before harvest, you sit down and you say, yes, bitter pit, no bitter pit, yes, bitter pit, no bitter pit. And you come up with a number or percent incidence, add the number six to it. And that's your prediction of bitter pit out of storage for that block. That's one prediction uh, model. It's actually a, a protocol. Uh, the second is what we call EMR or environmental mineral and rootstock model. It's developed here in Eastern New York. Uh, here we use uh, environmental conditions, your rootstock classification, and peel mineral analysis uh, in order to make a bit of a prediction for the block. The peel mineral analysis is conducted by uh, taking a peel sample using grandma's Norpro apple peeler, uh, the calyx end. In the Hudson Valley, we sample around August 1st, and about um, two and a half weeks later, 
up in the Champlain Valley, somewhere around the 15,000 Western New York. We, uh, we do analysis of those peels. Uh, in the past, we've done a wet ash digestive type analysis this year, and we've also collected data on SAP or water extraction analysis. This year, we'll be looking at both methods. The idea, again, is to economically predict the bitter pit in a block and make a decision whether you want to put that block into long-term storage or not. Uh, as we know, when we discussed it back in fruit school this year, we've probably reached the end of the line in terms of really super high prices on Honeycrisp. And if we're in a position of having to market our entire crop in the last waning months of the year, the October, November, December, prices will probably be depressed. We have to learn how to store this thing and market a fair amount of fruit in January, February, and March. I think it can be done, but it takes some work and it takes more management to be able to do it. I'll do a, a webinar sometime in mid-July on the prediction project. Many of you are involved in this project. There's 36 development orchards in Eastern New York, uh, now going into the fifth year. And the validation project involves an independent set of 80 orchards around the state. Um, again, many of you are involved. If you're interested in having other blocks in the program, please contact me. Um, thinking the mineral analysis cost would be around $30 per block per, per sample. So with that, I'll take any questions. No questions currently. Okay, very good. Well, that brings us to the end of our program. So again, uh, many of you stayed with us. We appreciate that. I hope, uh, I thought it went very well. Very, very happy with all the presentations. I hope you all got something out of it. Join us again at the same time, same day next week. Uh, we'll be focusing on thinning with, with Terrence Robinson. Hopefully we'll be at the point of fruit set and we'll be approaching the eight to 10 millimeter thinning window and we'll have more data and, and be confident as to what we can expect for thinning this coming year. So unless there's anything else or anything else anybody wants to say, um, Thank you very much and have a good evening. I'll also just throw in real quick, Dan, I will be repeating the series for the Capital Region starting next week and for the Champlain Valley, uh, likely the week following that. Very good, thank you, Mike.